Hey everyone, welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This podcast is all about farmer's markets. Whether you're a farmer's market manager or a small farmer, food maker, or artisan selling at farmer's markets, you have found just the right podcast. I'm Kat Fields-White. And I'm Bridget Myers. We're longtime farmer's market managers, educators, and consultants. Get ready to catch up on all things farmer's market bros with us. Today, we're catching up with Maya Madsen of Maya's Cookies, an award-winning black woman-owned vegan cookie company located right here in San Diego, California. Maya took our Vendor 101 class just before launching her cookie company in farmer's markets in 2015. Now she operates two retail stores with two more to come and ships thousands of cookies nationwide. And Maya's Cookies is still a vendor at local farmer's markets. Let's chat with her about how her vegan cookie empire continues to expand and grow. Today's episode of Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast, is supported by San Diego Commercial Kitchen Rental. This state-of-the-art, fully equipped facility is located in a convenient central location and supports a variety of local farmer's market businesses. Refrigerated and dry storage, adjustable schedules, and customized rates for kitchen prep time. You bring the ideas, and they provide all the rest. To follow your dream and get started selling your recipes, click the San Diego Commercial Kitchen logo today on the resource page at FarmersMarketPros.com. Well, welcome back to Tent Talk, everybody. Today we are talking with our occasional Tent Talk co-host, Maya Madsen, about farmers market evolution, how to balance a thriving retail and online business with markets and events, and about extending Black History Month awareness to the rest of the year. Welcome back to Tent Talk, Maya. Hi, ladies. Nice to be here again. We are so excited to have you on as our occasional co-host. Yeah, I feel like you've been sort of missing a little bit this year. We we haven't heard from you quite as often. Our co-host is kind of slacking, but I know you have a lot of other stuff going on. <laughs> well, rest assured, I listen every Monday as soon as a new episode comes out. And when there have been episodes that didn't come out on Monday, I was tempted to text you and find out what's going on as your <laughs> official third co-host. I need to stay on top of things, find out what's going on. We do get texts from Maya, too, about various episodes. Huh, that was interesting. (laughs) You keep us in line. You keep us in line, even when you're so busy. (laughs) We appreciate it. So we'll just start with a little catch up with you, Maya. So any big changes in the last year? Any awards or exceptional press or accolades, as usual? What's been going on for you in 2023? Woo, so much going on. So much is always going on with a business that's growing and trying to grow and thrive, trying to thrive. A um, couple major things for me in 2023 is our work. I hired a fractional CFO. I didn't even know what that term meant two years ago. And let me just tell you, that was, it made a world of difference for our business. And the other thing that we did is I hired an experienced production manager, someone who has had pedigree and years in food manufacturing with a business that was growing and grew. And that also made a huge world of difference because you don't know what you don't know. For sure. Where, where'd you find your fractional CFO? I tried that. Or CEO or CFO? CFO. Yeah, CFO. I've tried that CFO thing and had a mixed experience. Um, not ruling out that it's a great idea. I think I maybe just, you know, didn't wasn't the perfect match. So how did you find somebody that's, that was great for you? A couple different ways. One, I asked for references throughout my network for people that um, I trust. And I also looked on LinkedIn and I interviewed a couple and I landed on the one that I thought could grow and help understood my business and my business model because we are somewhat unique. And that's how I landed on one. We were only able to afford this fractional CFO for a year because it is expensive. And, you know, it it was something that I had to do in order to grow my business the way I'm trying to grow it. And also it was expensive. So long-term we couldn't afford it, but it made a world of difference. Good investment. What is a fractional CFO for our listeners, just who might not understand what that role might be? Well, a fractional CFO is kind of an independent contractor Someone who the fractional part means that they are not an employee of your company, that they are an independent contractor, but they are an expert in their field of finance. So they are a chief financial officer as a uh, independent contractor. So I can't afford a chief financial officer at Maya's Cookies, 
but I can afford a fractional one, which means they're sometimes working for you or they're helping you reach your financial goals and forecast and teach you all the things that maybe you don't know because you've never been a financial officer. Um, yeah, that's basically, I don't know if that was a good description, but it's an independent contractor of a financial officer. That yeah. is a good description. And it sounds like, I mean, did you go in knowing that you just wanted to do it for a year and was part of the process with them, them setting up systems that you could then continue without them? Yes, that's exactly what happened. My son is our finance director and he does come with a pedigree in finance, but he has never run a small business meaning he hasn't had the experience of being a financial officer. So this person took my son under his belt and my son worked directly with him and reported to him on a weekly basis. And they came up with forecasts for the entire year. He helped my son and taught him how to forecast for a year. So what that has done for us is we can put in what our estimates are for revenue every day of the week, all the way throughout the entire year. And my son will come to me and say, okay, if you have this much revenue during this peak time, here's where we're going to be three months from now. Here's, this is based on, you know, projections, obviously. So things can go up or down, but at least it gives you a snapshot of if you're going to run out of cash at any point, or (laughs) if you're going to have an excess of cash at any point. Neither of which has happened with my cookies yet. We kind of stay even, but you know, at least we have a forecast and we can predict what would happen if we don't do certain things or if we do do certain things. And it's really helpful. I highly recommend. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I think you know our our job is weird. Our businesses are weird, and I find <laughs> that working with bookkeepers and accountants sometimes it's really hard for them to get their heads around what we do. We're not just a retail business. Um, We're not just a consulting business. We do a lot of different things, event management. um, And that seems to confuse them a little bit. Yeah. So what a great valuable investment to make in your business as a farmer's market vendor and also retail and wholesale business owner. I think that's just great because then you can get someone that really can take on that role, even if it's just for a year. I mean, it would be nice, of course, for all of us to have full-time CFOs as part of our business. But really, I mean, it sounds like you use that person to their best, you know, potential and and greatest asset for your business by teaching your son. So that can continue on. So that's awesome. Yeah, that was a great thing. Now my son knows how to do that. And we also have that person as a resource. So even though they're not, we're not paying them anymore, if we ever have any questions, um, we can go back to them and ask them for advice or ask them to help something make sense. So it's great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then production manager. I mean, I think you, when you had that big leap during COVID, I'm sure you kind of shot from the hip and figured out how to do massive levels of production, unlike your old levels of production. But so I take it this person brought, you didn't have to reinvent the wheel. They may have like polished up your wheel a little bit. Yes, they definitely polished up the wheel, took a lot of things off of my plate, such as supply chain, working with vendors, um, managing costs with those vendors. Those are things that I was just doing, but I wasn't deep dive doing, right? Also creating standard operating procedures. I didn't even know what an SOP meant. And this production (laughs) manager came in and said, we need SOPs for every department. And we need, you know, each employee needs to follow through with these SOPs and check them off and then report to me at the end of the day and I can sign off. And I had no idea that was even something I should have been doing. I was just using trust and assuming that I I told an employee to do something that they would follow through and do it. And that doesn't always happen. But now this accountability system of having standard operating procedures, a checklist and someone that they have to report to, to show that they've done those things has made a world of difference. Amazing. What a nice way to smooth that operation out. Did you add anything to your not to do list? Yeah, um, this one is painful. And, you know, I still have a little PTSD from it. And I am still dealing with it. But I no longer will hire friends. Oh, or children of friends. Sounds like a hard lesson. Yes, very hard lesson. And when there's now that there's SOPs and accountability, Um, It just makes everything run a little bit smoother and not everyone, when you're used to doing things a certain way, maybe not everyone feels that they should have to change. And when you're the boss and you're also someone's friend, sometimes that can get a little muddy and difficult and people 
don't know how to separate that. I do. And I separate it. I don't know. I just, I can do that, (laughs) but I don't think other people can. And it causes, uh, or it caused some unfortunate events, but growing pains. That's definitely, I feel like anyone running a business will learn that at some point. I definitely learned that lesson when I ran a restaurant in my 20s and all my 20-year-old friends wanted to work there. And I hired a bunch of them. And I think it worked out with one out of 100 people that I hired. So, I mean, that's a good lesson to learn and and it'll help your business in the long run. I think a lot of farmer's market vendors probably find themselves in that situation since the hours are weird or any kind of retail business. And so you want to just hire people that are excited about your business and love you and they want to help. But being an employee is different than being a friend for sure. Yeah. Well, and it feels like you're sharing an opportunity. Yeah. I mean, you've got a business that's thriving. It's like, oh, I want to teach this business, this person, you know, how to how to work with a growing business, a thriving business. So it feels like you're helping them out, giving them a job. But then unless you're – we're pretty good at compartmentalizing because we've done it since Bridget was a little kid. And, you know, it was like this is what happens at work and this is what happens at home. And, yeah, yeah, you can not be talking to me at home, but at work you have to <laughs> behave like a professional. <laughs> um, but not everybody's – grows up like that or or understands that and they take it more personally. Yeah. Yep. So lesson learned. And then what what decisions are you happiest that you made last year? I think I'm happiest that I made those two significant hires, obviously, um, and that I started networking a little bit more. I found time to do that. And that has really helped me in ways I never thought it could help. Um, just getting out there and getting more, I was always involved in the community, but this is allowing me to networking has allowed me to meet other people in my industry, other people in the community with nonprofits and, you know, just help me along the way, whether that's recommending a fractional CFO or giving an opportunity to join a board of directors for a cause, a nonprofit that I'm passionate about. So the networking part for me has been great. It's out of my comfort zone because sometimes you don't want to do it. But every time I go to an event, I always walk away with a meaningful connection. I think I've said that on this podcast before. And now when I'm on my way to the event, I always say to myself, I wonder what meaningful connection I'm going to walk away with after this event is over. And it never fails. So it's been amazing. You're good at that networking and connecting thing, too, because I've run into you at networking events, and you've always been really good about saying, oh, you should meet this person here, meet meet Kat, and, or you know, meet the person that you're with. And I think you're really good at knowing who should know each other and and really intentional about keeping those chains of, of uh, connections going. Thank you. I try not to overstep because I know that there's a fine line. But there's no sense in gatekeeping in our industry. We all need to help each other. So I don't know why more people don't engage in that. <laughs> there's no sense in gatekeeping. If you know, a, you know, a phenomenal co-packer or, you know, someone who's looking for work, who's amazing or a fractional CFO or whatever, share, share the knowledge. Yeah. See if it can help someone else. Yeah, yeah. you're amazing at that. I love it. Um, so do you have any, uh, talking about the future now of what we're looking forward to in uh, 2024, do you have any new product lines or products coming up? I, I know that I can <laughs> see all the new stuff that comes to our market, but you always have such great ideas of new things to add to your product line. So what's what's in the shoot coming up now? Woo, Bridget, girl, let me just <laughs> tell you, my marketing team had to have a you know talk with me at one point and said, look... You need to slow your wall a little bit. They didn't say that. But basically, I think I've come to terms with the fact that I might be a creative because I'm always coming up with all kinds of different creative things that I think we should do or try or and I forget that, you know, I can't just shoot off the hip. My marketing team has to strategize and plan and design and all that. So with that being said, of course, I have a bazillion things coming up the pipe. Um, (laughs) Currently, uh, we're trying to host at our facility. Um, Once a month, we're hosting a food truck or another vendor and giving them the opportunity to sell their product. Of course, we want people and businesses that align with our company culture and our mission and also who provide phenomenal product. But that's twofold. It's A, it drives more traffic to our store, number one. B, it gives another vendor an opportunity to make some revenue and introduce their product to another audience. And it's just fun. Cookies are fun. And people come to our cookie shop 
to have fun. They want to smell the cookies, look at the cookies, eat the cookies, and maybe get a good meal as well. And we play music and put out, I invested in a couple of uh, picnic tables with umbrellas, the whole nine yards. So that's what's going on as far as, uh, that's not a new product, but just something we've been doing. Um, and for all the health inspectors out there, yes, we do have our annual permit to host in case anyone's wondering. So there's some costs involved with that. <laughs> I like this disclaimer because I'm sure, I, hopefully the health department's listening in and just so excited to tune into Tent Talk right? every week. Exactly. They're huge fans. So they're huge fans, fans. of ours. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you're dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's because you're Maya. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, the other thing always, I can't stop the creative juices flowing with cookie ideas. This week... We are hosting Ube Week at our shop. So everything Ube, we're going to have Ube soft serve. We're going to have Ube cookies, Ube cookie dough. We just, it's Ube, 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 right? So I'm always trying to look for ways to drive traffic and get people excited to come purchase cookies. This is a slow time of year for us because most Americans are, uh, well, okay, I shouldn't generalize like that. A lot of people are trying to watch their caloric intake in January. And maybe they're not indulging in desserts as much as they used to. So well, that's what they say. That's what they we see them at the market loading up their bags with free cheese and cookies. We always laugh that markets are super busy in January because people make resolutions to eat better and work out and shop local. And they sure do. They come out to the market and they shop local and they load up on cookies. Yes. I love it. Guilty. I love it. Guilty of that. Still good for you. I was going to, I mean, I've just saw your Ube kind of posts going out and it's like just when I think that you have seriously like tackled every cookie variety known to humankind you just come up with new stuff and it's so exciting to see that because there's just endless possibilities and you're right cookies are very fun and there's always something new to do and I, I like that you host other vendors at your facility and get to kind of bring folks together so that's really exciting um, and are you doing any other new markets or pop-ups um I know that you're really focused on online sales and wholesale and all your shops, but we still see you at the market. So what's going on with that? Bridget, 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 let me just tell you, and all the vendors out there listening, I had a fractional CFO for a year break down our financials. And guess what they helped us do? Categorize every channel of sales that we have. And what we have identified is the markets are one of the best channels for the best margins. And not only that, it's a marketing opportunity for you to get your brand out there in front of thousands of people, for you to talk to those people, for those people to find out about you, discover you. So customer acquisition rate, all of those things. And that is one thing that with the fractional CFO, he said, why aren't you doing more of these? And I said, that's what I said. Nothing. So we. <laughs> so I always knew all of those things, but I thought because I didn't know what I didn't know, and I thought I needed to channel my energy in other directions and also just stay involved with the farmers market. But I always knew all those great things about it. Maybe not so much the the uh, the margins that he was able to really hone in on with us. But once he honed in on that, it just was like, why not? It's a win-win. So for that reason, absolutely, we're going to be in markets and continue to be in markets. And I'm trying to get into more markets, to be honest with you, because it's just more exposure. We want to grow our retail footprint as well in other areas. And so the best way to, in my opinion, as a small business owner, to reach that audience is to go out into the community and... um participate in their local farmer's market, participate in some of their community events. I've joined Chamber of Commerce from other regions because I want to get involved and see what their, the economic, you know, what it looks like in their region, what the future is, and also to meet other business owners and understand it before I just dive in and open up a retail spot in that area. So um, that's my long, that was a long-winded answer. But yes, yeah, we're trying to get into more farmers market. So if you can uh, help us and <laughs> in the letters of recommendation, I will say I am super proud of the fact that we were voted Critics Choice Farmers Market Vendor of the Year for our local magazine, San Diego Magazine, two years in a row. So I'm super proud of that because 
you know, it's critics. <laughs> it's not just our friends phoning in and placing the votes. These are actual critics. So I'm excited about being in more markets. You do have a really great reputation, I think, for being a great vendor on the market management side, just because your staff is always so wonderful. I know you have some brought on some new staff for markets last year, and they're just you do such a great job training them and you know, showing up on time and having a great presence and bringing enough product to the market. I mean, those are all things that really matter when market managers are looking at bringing on new vendors. So I don't I don't think you'll have any trouble getting in, but i um, excited to hear that your CFO said that, of course, <laughs> and um, we'll definitely be using that poll quote when we <laughs> post this episode. Uh, and it, And it's great. And it's great to have a professional tell you that about your business model as well, because we have always believed, obviously, that that, you know, you can bring in all that extra exposure. You get to keep more of those margins when you're at the market. And it's just such an important place to have a part of your business. And we hear that from other market vendors that go into, they're looking into retail shops or being part of stores. And having a presence at the farmer's market is great for those folks that are running those operations or wanting to rent you space at a retail shop because you have a known presence. You have a following from being at the farmer's market. So that's just a, a really wonderful kind of way to bring your business somewhere else and, That's true. and kind of I, prove it first. I always forget about that, but we've had um, vendors tell us when they went into opening a retail store that – and at first retail store – that it was really valuable to them when talking to a leasing agent or a landlord to be able to say, I've been at this farmer's market for this long. So even though they hadn't had a shop before, they could show that they had continuity and they paid their rent on time to that market and you know they knew how to run a business. Exactly. Yeah, it's really meaningful. Um, so with your staff always being so wonderful at the market, of course, and then when I stop in your shop, they're great there as well. Any tips on recruiting and training and retaining staff? Besides not hiring family and yeah, friends. That, yes. I mean, that's a great tip, actually. Everybody write that down. But for folks that are not your friends coming on board, what are some kind of good tips for making them spectacular? Well, I have a few. And it all boils down to those good old SOP, standard operating procedures. It's really important for me that people understand our company culture. We're cookies. We are a mission-driven company. Another term I didn't know that what that meant until a few years ago. That's just how we've always been. So we are very engaged in the community. We respect all. We're cookies. We're here to make people happy. People are coming to us to indulge and also to celebrate. Maybe they're buying cookies for a party. So you have to be, have to have a good, a nice, pleasant, happy personality. You can't be a grumpity grump grumps. When you're selling cookies, you're right. So that's one thing is understanding our company culture, understanding uh, our SOPs and having clear SOPs and clear communication and consistency. So it can't be this one week and the next week you change it. Oh, no, just do it this way. Everything is very clear. It's written down on a laminated sheet on a clipboard in our van and they have to check off each thing. And if something doesn't go right or they forgot something, it's because they didn't follow the SOPs. And that's just, I can't stress enough to other vendors hiring the importance of that and just consistency and understanding this is a business. I had, uh, at one point I hired someone and I went to, they're a great person. Everything's great. I went to the booth to just do a check and their grandma was sitting behind the booth in a, uh, a camping chair. And I said, who's that? And she said, that's my grandma. And, and I said, why is she sitting there? And, you know, I, I had to explain that this is a business. And I, I know your grandma's proud of you. I'm proud of you too. But this is a business and you have to have your, you know, health certification and your food handler's card to be working back here. And it clearly says on the SOPs, the only person allowed behind the booth is the employee. And man, that was a tough conversation uh, to get grandma out of that booth. Let me just tell you, grandma wasn't happy um, because that was her baby. And why was I telling her she couldn't sit back there? So clear communication, uh, not breaking the rules and following the same rules with every employee. (laughs) You know, I, I, I know a lot about markets. There's just some things about vendor you know, things that happen in the vendor's booth that I just don't ever realize are happening. And this is probably one well, of those times. Sometimes we take a glance yeah. and we have theories about what's happening. I do see grandma <laughs> sitting in the booth sometimes, but it doesn't occur to me like, yeah, they need to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, just a proud grandma. Oh, that's right. Well, yeah, imagine that's right. my surprise when I pull up and I'm like, who's that lady sitting <laughs> in the camping chair? Because A, you're not supposed to sit <laughs> yeah. when you're working in her. Definitely not a, you know, a lounging camp- camping chair. Yeah, it was just bizarre. Grandma needs to get up and make eye contact with customers at least, <laughs> at the very least, right? very least. Like the guy sitting in the chair in that fisherman's booth with the beer. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, what? I said, you can't do that here. He's like, what? <laughs> what? We're just hanging out. You know, we're outside. Seems casual. <laughs> oh, oh boy. Well, I, I love the idea of a clear SOP. Um, again, I'll say from the farmer's market management perspective, I, you know, we can tell when vendors have an SOP for their staff. There is nothing that gets under my skin more than a new employee coming to work a vendor's booth. And I have a shopper come tell me that that employee didn't take EBT because they didn't know what that is. And it's like, please communicate to your staff what is happening at the market. Um, it's really important. And having those kind of SOP uh, you know, guidelines and laminated sheets, it's just, you know, you do yourself a favor. <laughs> Breaking down early or setting up late, and it's like, oh well, they didn't tell me. Yeah, yeah. It's like, hey, so important. Pass that information around. So you do a great job of that. So thank you. And, <laughs> and I'd like to say I'm happy to share my laminated SOP sheet with any vendors that would like to see it, so that they can get an idea of what they should be looking for to do. And I'm also open to management. Maybe there's some things I'm not realizing that are left off the SOP. There's been times we've had to modify. So if you guys ever see anything, I appreciate when you let me know because we just want to keep improving and make sure that we have a mutually respectful engagement with our management team because it weren't, weren't for them putting on this event, we wouldn't have this opportunity to create revenue. Yep. So. I love that. I love that. You've always been a great partner with that. And I just, I think our, everything just runs so much more smooth for the vendors and the market in general and the market management when we're just cooperating on this and just saying, hey, why don't you update your SOP or tell us like what something management can do to help you you and your staff work better at the market. It's just that cooperation, I think, is definitely a lot of our intentions for 2024 is to bring everyone together like that a lot better. So I'm thinking maybe our our swag this year at the conference should be a laminator <laughs> and, you know, and pens, you know, those are watermark pens. I love it. Maya, you're a black woman owned business. I mean, all of the pieces of your market that differentiate you from other bakeries are good reasons that you end up in markets and you end up in prime retail spots and things. I mean, one of it's that the cookies are vegan. You wouldn't necessarily know that by picking up the cookie. It's just a delicious cookie. But the fact that it's vegan adds a whole set of customers to your lineup. Um, the fact that you're a black woman on business, I think, has helped you in some ways, obviously inhibit things in some ways because that happens with black owned businesses, but it's helped you especially in recent years, I mean, maybe to access some PR and things that you wouldn't have gotten recognition otherwise. So that's that's been helpful. And one of the things we know about you is that you always put out a new line of cookies for Black History Month. So how is Maya's Cookies going to be celebrating Black History Month here in February now that we're in it? Well, so every year, Maya's Cookies, me <laughs> and my team, we we put out a Black History collection. And the reason why I do that is because cookies are celebratory and it's a good gateway drug to open up a conversation, right? So I create cookies based around different people, different um, genres, whatever it may be, to share alternative stories of Black history that maybe we weren't taught in school. So this year, it's an Olympic year. So it took me a long time, but I finally landed on a theme and it was sports. It, did, it wasn't my first idea. I'm already thinking about next year's theme right now, because as a creative, I never know when these are going to come to me. So this year's theme is sports. We have three sports icons that I chose to create cookies around. One is Magic Johnson. And people may think, oh, that's obvious. He's a great basketball player. That's not the reason why I chose Magic Johnson. I chose Magic Johnson because of his business acumen. What a lot of people don't realize is that he is responsible for bringing Starbucks to the hood. And one of those Starbucks that he's responsible for bringing is close to one of the markets I started at. And it has his plaque in it. It's a Magic Johnson Starbucks. He basically went to... I forgot the guy's name, Howard Schultz or whoever of Starbucks and said, look, black people drink coffee too. Why don't you take a chance and I'll partner with you and let's bring, let's open up a Starbucks in the hood. How come you don't have any Starbucks in the hood? So he's responsible for that. He also created movie theaters in underserved communities and he's same thing. We like to go to the movies and it also is fun because the snack bar features things that are part of our culture that we like. And that was 
groundbreaking. No one had ever taken that type of a risk. He is a economic driver. So that's why I wanted to honor him because a lot of people don't know that. They know Magic Johnson. He was a Lakers. He played basketball, right? But they don't know all the undercurrent of his business acumen and what he does for our community. So we created a Magic Bar cookie. It's based on seven-layer Magic Bar, just turned into a cookie and made vegan. It's delicious. It's caramely. It's nutty. It's coconutty. It's chocolatey. It's, it's good. <laughs> so the next cookie that I made is, uh, it's called the Trailblazer. And it's based on Flo jo, Florence Griffith Joyner, who is a track icon. She is someone that I've always loved, and we lost her way too soon. In addition to what she did on um, track and field, she is an artist, and her art is phenomenal. She was just everything and more. So I created a butter rum cookie, and it looks like a snickerdoodle, only with gold edible gold dust. So it looks like a gold medal. And it's delicious. And the last cookie was called <laughs> the Grand Slam. And it's for Serena Williams. And rumor on the street is that she loves moon pies. So I made Amaya's cookies version of a moon pie. only made it a little extra because Serena's extra. And Serena is vegan. She's also vegan. So it's a dark chocolate cookie stuffed with marshmallow, cookie butter, and topped with a chocolate chunk from a black owned chocolatier and finished with a vanilla sea salt from a black owned spice company. So there's a lot of themes going on. There's also a lot of, again, I said, there's no reason to gatekeep. So I love trying to find other black owned ingredients to incorporate into these cookies, just to share stories and share my platform. And the last thing that I did, I've always wanted to create a special art piece, a decorative art piece for the box with a black owned artist. And we actually found an artist and have a limited edition special band that goes around the box of featuring her art that she made just for us. So I'm really happy about that. So it's just I love that. It's, it's a lot, but it's fun. I know it's early in February, so you may not know yet. But um, I mean, is how many boxes of Serena Williams ordered do we do we know i don't know i hope she orders <laughs> how could she not that's amazing how so how do you communicate you know people pick up a cookie and they go oh moon pie cool this is awesome um how does that whole backstory get out does it do you think most people who are buying and eating these amazing cookies understand the backstories that you go through to get to them they will because i'll be sharing as often as i can we um we create a I don't know what it's a trifold that goes in each box that talks about my inspiration. We had a special uh, kickoff, virtual kickoff meet and greet with our customers where I talked about the cookies and my process and the inspiration with how I came about. And yeah, every opportunity I get with media, anything, we, we pitch our cookies to our media list. As soon as I know what the theme's going to be and I have the recipes down and the R&D done, we pitch it to our PR list. The goal is October. So I have to have everything done by October so oh, that boy. we can pitch it in time. And then we just hope that they pick up on it and want to get a sample and learn more. So the ball's in their court with that. But any opportunity I get, I talk about it. And I'm just, I'm really proud and I'm passionate. And I want to continue to be able to tell Black stories that maybe we weren't told, that people don't know about. Yeah, my dad was a track coach and I'm a huge FloJo fan. So I'm very <laughs> excited. we uh, loading up on those this month. Amazing. Excellent. So what are some good, intentional, respectful ways for markets to celebrate Black History Month as a as a market group? Oh, wow. Kat, that's an awesome question. And of course, I can't speak for everybody, but I can just speak from my own lived experience of what I think. I love when I go to markets because like you, when I travel, I always go to their farmer market. <laughs> I love when I see like a badge or signage, something on their booth saying, um, Local owned, family owned, LGBTQI owned, female owned, black owned. So I would love if our market management team or someone would allow us, or maybe just for consistency purposes, maybe they have something um, like signifying that this vendor is black owned or mm -hmm. female owned or whatever, LGBTQI, whatever it may be. 
because I intentionally as a shopper look for those vendors too, because I know that um, I want to support them. So I think that would be a great way. And also uh, maybe sharing and highlighting uh, if they have an email list or something, just sharing it's Black History Month. These are our vendors because not everyone knows who owns what or what vendors are black owned or family owned. So I think that would, that's a great way, just uplifting us by letting the community know we're here and shopping and supporting. That's always great. I love seeing all the support. I love it. That's awesome. I think the fine line that we get to is we're trying to be careful to be celebrative with, without being performative or exploitative. You know, if you're not upholding your black vendors and your black shoppers throughout the year, Using Black History Month just to try to, you know, turn it into a sale is not cool. So do you have any tips on how to avoid that kind of situation? I feel that if it's coming from your heart, it's going to come out that way, right? If you can tell when it's performative. And one thing that I've noticed that is hurtful to me is we do a lot of corporate business, meaning large corporations will call us and they'll ship out, you know, cookie boxes to all their employees during Black History Month. And... So we had one incident, and it's not just once it's happened before, where they'll say, okay, and will you, you know, we want to order 100 boxes, but in exchange, will you donate a portion of the proceeds to our charity? And I would just say, sure, because I wanted, you know, to be able to have it. And my marketing team finally said, why why can't you just keep your revenue for once? Why do you have to share? Like it's supposed to be black history month to honor you. And these were non-black people telling me who on my team said, why do we have to always share how it's black history month? You should be able to celebrate you and be able to keep your profits and not have, like we do share, we're mission driven. And that's a big part of our um, culture at Maya's cookies is supporting the community. But my team said, how about this one month? They don't ask you to like, discount your product for them or, or, (laughs) you know, donate to their organization or not donate, donate to their charity that they support. How come they just can't donate as they usually do? So I don't know how to break that down to a simple explanation of what that's called, but I guess that is my way of answering your question of how to exploit. Yeah, I guess, you know, and I, and I think it breaks down to a really short message, pay, pay black people. Um, and I, I mean, and that's extended to pay women, pay small makers, pay farmers. These are not the people that should be automatically considered philanthropists. They should get paid for their efforts. You know, the, there's there's other people with big money who have had a privileged path to big money. And these are not the people we should be asking to donate to things. Awesome that you do donate when you can, but that, that shouldn't be part of a transaction. Yes, I agree. And I just, just to put the audience and give some perspective on this, Black History Month, which is the shortest month of the year, which is another conversation, is our busiest month of the year, bigger mm-hmm. than Christmas. Wow. Bigger than Christmas. Wow. So I appreciate it. I love it. And thank you because it really is meaningful to our bottom line. And it helps us on those months where we have, you know, every company has a bad month. We have a couple bad months where the sales that we get from people supporting our business really help us stay in business throughout the year. So it really is meaningful and it makes a huge difference. And I appreciate it. Keep shopping from us. And if you like our product and you need cookies later, shop from us later as well. But I really do appreciate that support. And I I love the fact that, um, you know, people are a little bit more open to shopping Black owned during Black History Month because they're going to discover some amazing products and businesses that maybe they hadn't discovered before. So thank you for wanting to even have this conversation. Let's with this. Yeah, what we want to do, obviously, is chat as market managers and as people that support various businesses. We need to make sure that our markets are more welcoming and inclusive all year. We need to shop black business all year. Let's let's break it out of February, folks. Let's make this let's make Black History Month all year long. I you, you know what? I have a couple other suggestions that are short that I think are fun. Um I love when the farmers market has music, but I must admit it's always the same sort of type of genre of music. I would love maybe once to have some soul music or maybe something that's more for the culture because we're out there. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. I love the Eagles and I love, you know, (laughs) Yacht Rock. 
but I also love hip hop, <laughs> soul music too. So that would be fun if every now and then we just had some, you know, more diverse music or even there's so much art and culture in the black community, poetry slams, some amazing poets and so, so much entertainment, dancers, majorettes, whatever. <laughs> um, it's just something. <laughs> I want a majorette or a drum line. Huh? Yes. Come Here on. we go. Here we go. Don't get cat started on a drum line. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got? Um, that those were my those are the main things. Cool. I would love to go to a market and someone's playing, you know, music from my culture. And just to put it in context, at Maya's Cookies, we have a specific playlist that we play in the store. And guess what that playlist is called? Cookout music. And I curate <laughs> that playlist and it's cookout music. It's music from the 70s, 80s, and 90s that you're going to hear at the cookout in your backyard, good time music, and people walk into my store dancing, or they'll be, they'll say, oh, I love this song. So music is an important part of our culture. So that's why that came into my mind. Yeah, good job. definitely makes a difference, I think. Yeah. And I think it's great. I mean, I do think there's more people now recognizing Black History Month, making an effort to shop from Black businesses during Black History Month. But, you know, our our next... I think goal is to break it out of that month. We've got some presentations at the Intense Conference. Sandrina will be back. She spent a lot of time talking about how to honor your legacy residents and make your markets more culturally welcoming with things like music. Um, she's going to talk this year about beyond the anti-racist toolkit. How do we keep this going? How do we spread it? How do we make us all welcoming places for all kinds of people, including black people? Mm -hmm. And being authentic about it. Exactly. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. That's awesome. So what's, uh, thinking ahead again, what's your crystal ball showing you nowadays about your <laughs> business? What what kind of trends are you seeing uh, in the economy overall? And like, where's business going in 2024? Any thoughts, Ooh. any thoughts to share? <laughs> yeah, well, this economy is something else. Let me tell you, <laughs> this for, I mean, lean, you got to be lean and mean. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion on it. And you have to go into this with the, you know, you got to put your big girl pants on and get stuff done. You know, that's my motto. And you need to be lean and mean. You have to be on top of your books if you're going to survive. Our costs have gone up through the roof and I'm not the only one. So just this economy, I think, is going to be difficult. And I'm worried we're going to lose more vendors and businesses. And I'm... I've actually been meeting with a few vendors who reach out to me and just sitting down with them and um, trying to share again, you don't want to gatekeep and give them, you know, I've learned a lot working at the markets and I've learned a lot from you guys. And I share that. And when I teach that to others, they say, how do you know that? And I'm like, well, because the market managers taught me this. Right. So I think just, Oh, let me go back to your original question. It's going to be a tough economy and you really need to lean on your network, your resources and help from others. And I don't mean financial help, just help in every way. Right. And just have a plan. So we have a plan until next year because I don't want to go into this without a plan. Who knows what's going to happen in the next few months, the next quarter or whatever. And I want to be prepared because I have employees that rely on their job at Maya's Cookies. We have moms, we have dads, I have students, I have, this is their job. So it's important that me as the CEO of the company to have a plan so that we can weather whatever may come our way. And I tell other vendors that as well, you just can't fly by the night, fly by the seat of your pants and hope for the best. You need to be intentional and have a plan. So get lean and mean, maybe cut staff if you need to, but try to avoid it. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to avoid it. Yeah, I think that's great. And that kind of reflects a lot of conversations that I've had with our vendors at our markets. And actually, when I'm at other markets around town, I've been like visiting other markets just to shop because I'm too busy at our own markets. But just when I have time to chat with vendors, the the thought seems to be sometimes it feels like the sales aren't coming in, like the economy's down, people are being a little bit tighter with their wallets. And then some days are feeling really, really busy and folks are selling out and the markets are just mobbed. But like you said, if they aren't prepared on the back end, like financially and getting their ordering correct and watching their food waste and their food costs and doing everything they can on the back end, those like big ebb and flows are really going to it can tank you. 
And so having a plan is a really good strategy. It's not that everything's going down, down, down all the time and food costs are all going up, up, up. It's just finding that, like, if something's not working, make some changes. If you're having a hard time keeping the book straight, like, reach out for help and try to figure that out before it gets to a point where you're so far gone, you, it's hard to turn back and, and fix some stuff. So I think that's great advice. And I'm constantly remembering, reminding our vendors, you know, the markets are busy and the people are out there. They want to spend their money. They want to shop local. That's still very important to folks. But we, we're in a different economy now. We need to be aware that things are changing and we need to change with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to that point, Bridget, there are people that want to help you. And what I mean by that is at our local university, they have a small business administration group called The Brink. And I've turned other vendors onto The Brink because it's free resources, free legal Uh, I'm meeting with an expert right now on growth strategy. These are people I can't afford to hire, but their whole purpose is to help small business owners. And I didn't, I don't even know how I got connected to them. I think someone referred me. So there are people, you don't have to always spend money on things. There are people in your community that are there to help you. And the Brink is a perfect example of that. I meet with a mentor there once a month. He just does a checkup call with me. And basically some day, some months, all I do, it was unload on him all, you know, the problems I'm having because I don't have anyone else to unload these problems on. And he's a former business owner who's bought and sold several businesses. You know, he has pedigree and he understands and he's been there. Just someone to talk to and, you know, you need a voice or an ear and also, you know, legal help when you need legal help that's free. So there are resources out there. So I would recommend that people look for those. Or if you don't know, send them my email address. I will take a Zoom call and share. I have a whole list of organizations that I've worked with that help me. If you need staff, you know, that's a big part of a business and a, you know, a big cost. Every year we have two interns from uh, Junior Achievement. I'm on their board of directors. I joined their board of directors and we get two interns from a local high school. And the whole purpose is for us to teach them how to be an employee. You, you know, show up on time, all the things you show up on time, you follow SOP, blah, blah, blah right? It's their first job. And it's twofold because I told the director this. I said, to be honest with you, this helps our bottom line. It helps my bottom line. But I also feel great that I'm able to mentor these two young people with their first job. This is a safe place where they can make mistakes and I can coach them. So even employees, you know, there's ways that you can weather this storm that we may have coming up and I'm happy to help. So send people my way. I think it's such an inspiration to have you say that because people look at you and you've been in business quite a long time now and you've got retail stores and you've got online and you've got a lot of markets, you've got a lot of public presence. If you, who appears to be absolutely an expert in this market and retail and food manufacturing thing, if you could admit that it's helpful for you to get help and advice, then, you know, those newer vendors shouldn't be embarrassed to know that help, help is helpful. Yep. Get it when you need it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to wrap up with uh, talking a little bit about work-life balance because I've actually noticed, because Maya and I text sometimes and she'll say, well, on my way to the Bahamas. Um, (laughs) We've noticed that just (laughs) recently you've actually traveled and you took actual vacations this last year um, and have some some coming up. And that, I mean, am I mistaken that that's kind of a new thing for you, at least in recent years? Um, Is it something that's because your business has reached a certain level of stability and maturation, or is it more of a change in your mindset and your attitude about work-life balance? It's a little of all those things, Kat. And people that don't know, in 2020, our business went viral. And from 2020 to 2023, all I've been doing is trying to keep my head above water to keep up with the change and the growth. And it's been taxing. So there's some few elements to that. Number one, my youngest child graduated through college, so I'm an official empty nester, right? So there's that. And for the first time since 1999, I'm not paying some sort of tuition. So Congratulations. (laughs) I aspire to be you you. one day. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. So it's part empty nester, part I, you know, I'm in my 50s now and I realize that I need to embrace life a little bit more. It's not all about work. So my husband and I have been intentional with just making time. We got married young and had kids young. And it's time for us to enjoy the fruits of our labor. So yes. 
And also I recognize that I need to take care of myself because if I don't take care of myself, there is no Maya's cookies. You're not getting that creative black history collection next year. So <laughs> I need to take care of myself. And I was putting others before myself and I still do because I'm just a nurturer and I'm an empath and that's just how I am. But I am trying to make more time for myself. So what are you doing besides uh, besides the travel? What other kinds of things do you do to take care of you and kind of balance business and family? Well, I exercise every day. I always have, but that kind of took a back seat during that three year growth. So I am exercising more. I am taking, I love to be alone and reflect. And my husband knows that and respects it. So I'm just taking more time to be alone with myself in my little garden and having tea Ah. and indulging in things that I like to do. That's it. That's how I rebuild. I get in a little spot by myself and read. Imagining Maya sipping tea in her little garden is just making me feel really wonderful. So thank you for that. (laughs) It's just a busy, you know, go-getter kind of woman that's always just ready to go and ready to make things happen. It's important to remind folks that even these people that are, you know, running these really big successful businesses, they, you know, it's important to take time to sit back and relax and enjoy the fruits of your labor by, you know, enjoying yourself and and taking that time for yourself. So I'm happy to hear that, Maya. Um, And then we're going to wrap up, but any other words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our many listeners who know and adore and love you? (laughs) I want to say, keep your head up. It's going to get tough. Owning a small business is going to hand it to you in every which way, but you need to just keep on. If you're passionate about what you do, just know it's going to be hard and you have to find that inner perseverance and strength. Even at the lowest times I've been through it myself, there have been some lows that I never thought I could get to, but you have to just persevere. Know that there are people that want us help you and support you and put your big girl or big boy pants on and keep going. And if you need a pep talk, send me a message. I'll give you a pep talk. (laughs) And keep keep doing what you're doing and just expect the unexpected. Get lean and mean this year. We can do this. You got this. We got this. Thank you, Maya. Thanks, Maya. So great to catch up with you. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening today. And big thanks to San Diego Commercial Kitchen Rental for supporting local food makers with fully equipped shared kitchen rental space to bring their dreams to reality as farmer's market vendors. And for supporting Tent Talk, the farmer's market podcast. To get your custom quote for kitchen times and rates, click their logo on the resource page at farmersmarketpros.com today. Ready to explore more ways to make your market less stressful and more profitable? While you're on the Farmer's Market Pros website, click register on the homepage and save your seat today for Intense, the National Farmer's Market Conference, live in San Diego and online next month, March 4th, 5th, and 6th, 2024. Thanks for listening to TED Talk today. Please leave us a review on your podcast app or wherever you listen to TED Talk. Let us and others know how you're enjoying the podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode of Tent Talk. Connect with fellow Farmer's Market folks in our private Facebook group, the Farmer's Market Pros community. Follow us on Instagram at Farmer's Market Pros and find online education and other resources on our website at farmersmarketpros.com. Tent Talk is brought to you by Farmer's Market Pros, where passion meets profit. Tent Talk is produced by Leandra Hayes with original music by David Mead. Tune in next week for another great episode.